Hi, and welcome to church. My name is Michelle Hopp, and I serve as the pastor for the Arlington and the Poinette Inch United Methodist Churches. And I hope that you've had a good week. And I'm so glad that you're here to join me for worship. We are starting a new sermon series today, and it is about the creeds, in particular, the Apostles' Creed, which many of us learn growing up in church or in confirmation class or Sunday school or whatever, something that we often say in church services too. And the creeds are, are a saying that gives our Christian beliefs. So we're going to go into this in more detail to try to understand what do we really believe in. So I invite you to join uh, together and I'll say an opening prayer. Lord, I believe that you are God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Amen. So the creeds, and we're going to start with that first line, I believe in God. Okay, so the Apostle Creed is our Christian church's faith statement. Any of you who have confirmation kids in your life know they write their own faith statement. But we as a church, a universal church, we have a, a faith statement that we almost, almost all denominations agree with. But how did it come into being? Where did it come from? Why did the early church leaders decide to write and adopt this belief, this, this Apostles' Creed, about 100 years after Jesus died? Well, there's two reasons. One of them, the first, it was written to defend the Christian faith. You see, after Jesus died and he wasn't there anymore to teach his disciples, people had to do the thinking on their own with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. But they were coming with, up with all kinds of new and creative ideas about who is God, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit. And some of these beliefs were getting out of control, according to the early church um, fathers. And so, for example, the Gnostic Christians, they believe that God did not create the earth. There's no way they said that God could have created the earth because the earth was evil and God is good. So to them, that didn't make sense. So they said that the earth was created by a little God called a Demiurge. And it was okay that the Demiurge created the earth because I guess he wasn't the ultimate God. In addition, the Gnostics believed that Jesus didn't have a human body because humans are evil. See, see the consistent streak there? And Early church leaders were just worried about these beliefs that were floating all around. This is just one of them, but there were others. And they wanted to do something to keep these, these um, not true beliefs from spreading. And so they wrote and they adopted the Apostles' Creed. They wanted to, people to know that God did create the heavens and the earth. And they also wanted to prove that Jesus had a human body. And so they wrote that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. That's part of the creed, too. Early church leaders wrote the Apostles' Creed to defend Christian beliefs. But there was a second reason why the early church fathers uh, wrote the creed, and that has to do with baptism. Many baptismal candidates were eager to get baptized, but a lot of them, they didn't know how to read. And so they needed a way to uh, learn the basics. And so they needed something that they could memorize. And in their preparation classes for baptism, which took a really long time, they memorized the Apostles' Creed. And then when they were being baptized, they could answer these questions. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven of earth, the heaven and earth? And they could reply, yes, I do. And then when they were asked, do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? Well, then these baptismal candidates, even though they couldn't read, they could say, I do, I do believe in that, because I know the Apostles' Creed. And then when they were asked, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Again, they could say, I do. 
because they had this memorized from the Apostles' Creed. So the early church leaders wrote and adopted the Apostles' Creed to defend the Christian faith and to teach the faith to new believers. In the opening chapter of the Bible in Genesis, the Bible clearly says that God is the creator of heaven and earth. It says in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, when God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was a shapeless, chaotic mess with the spirit of God brooding over the dark vapors. And then God said, let there be light. And the light appeared and God was pleased with it and divided the light from the darkness. He called the light daytime and the night and the darkness nighttime. And together they formed the first day. We say that God is the creator of heaven and earth. Yet we often fall short of telling everybody how great God is because do we really understand it? Why do we have such a hard time explaining who God is? Well, maybe the parable of the blind men and the elephant will help us to understand. In this ancient fable, there are six blind mice. <laughs> Goodness, I'm thinking I'm thinking a different kind of parable nursing rhyme. <laughs> there were three blind men. No, there were six. I'm really, really, I should start this all over again because I'm getting mixed up. Let's try this again. So in this ancient parable, six blind men, there we go, visit the palace of the Raja and encounter an elephant for the first time. And as each man touches the elephant with their hands, he announces his discoveries. The first blind man put out his hand and touched the elephant's side. How smooth, he said, an elephant is like a wall. And then the second man put his hand out and touched the elephant's trunk. How round, he said, an elephant is like a snake. And then the third blind man put out his hand and touched the elephant's tusk. He said, how sharp. An elephant is like a spear. And then the fourth blind man put out his hand and touched the leg of the elephant. How tall, he said. If the leg is this high, I can't imagine how tall this elephant is. An elephant is like a tree. Then the fifth blind man reached out his hand. He touched the ear of the elephant. How wide, he said. An elephant is like a fan, like one of those pretty ornamental fans you fan yourself with. And the sixth blind man put out his hand and he touched the elephant's tail. How thin, he said, an elephant is like a rope. Well, these six blind men started to argue with each blind man thinking his own perception was the correct one. The Raja, the ruler, awakened by the commotion, called out from the balcony. He said, hey, guys, the elephant is a big animal. He said, each one of you only touched one part. You must combine all the parts to get an idea of what an elephant really is. And enlightened by the Raja's wisdom, the blind men reached an agreement. Each one of us only knows one part, they said. To find the truth, we must put all of our parts together. And like this parable of the six blind men, got it right that time, the blind men reached an agreement. Each one of us only knows one part. We gotta find the truth by putting all of our parts together. Like the blind men, feeling the elephant, you know, we sometimes, we paint a picture of God that's just too small. I sometimes think that the Psalmist got it right. They, have, they give the best descriptions of God as the creator. I imagine they would camp outside at night and stare at the stars until they fell asleep. In Psalm 19, 1 through 3, we read, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night, they keep on telling about God. Without a sound or word, silent in the skies. Their message reaches out to all the world. 
And in another psalm, the psalmist said in Psalm 8, 3 through 4, When I look up at your skies and what your fingers have made, Lord, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are us, us human beings, that you think about them? What are human beings that you even pay attention to them, that you pay attention to us? God created the heaven and the earth. But do we have evidence of this? I know the Gnostics sure thought that it didn't make sense that the Supreme God would have made the earth. So what evidence do we have? Well, an Oxford University mathematician, John Lennox, he said, the odds that the universe organized itself, and this is for you math geeks, you'll know what this looks like, is one to 10 to the 40,000th power. In other words, the odds are nearly impossible. But for most of us who aren't, the, aren't big math uh, aficionados, <laughs> probably the easiest way to imagine this is as a chocolate cake. Imagine, just imagine a chocolate cake, you know, the one that you like the best. It's probably double layers. It's got frosting on the top, maybe some decorations on it. And imagine that what it would take for all of the ingredients just sitting around to assemble them themselves spontaneously. Even if we waited billions of years, could the eggs, the flour, the sugar, the cocoa, and the oil automatically mix and bake and ice themselves or frost themselves into this beautifully decorated baked cake that's scrumptious that everybody wants a piece of. And most of us would answer, no, there's no way that it could do this on its own. However, people who don't believe in God say that there's some natural explanation that doesn't need God, some X factor to explain why the earth was created or why this cake could be made all by itself. And you know, the truth is, Christians and atheists, we usually can't convince each other of our beliefs. It's just the truth. I'm friends with atheists. We both seem to be set in our ways. And you know, I, it, it's important for us to respect one another and to listen to each other's beliefs, but to understand that we can't always necessarily change people. So why do Christians believe in God? I had asked some of our parishioners this and Peggy Morse from Arlington said this, I believe in, the, in a power greater than I. I choose to call it God. He has worked miracles in my life that have no other explanation. He puts things and people in my life just when I need them. God is good. Now, if you come to church on Sunday, we will show a video from, I believe it's the 2020 confirmation class. So an oldie, but a goodie in which the kids um, answer the question, what is one thing you should know about God? And I love how they answer this because it shows their faith and their belief in God. So why does faith in God matter? Did you ever think about that? Because in the grand scheme of things, we humans are small and insignificant. And the psalmist agrees. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 90, one through five, he said, Lord, you have been our help generation after generation. Before the mountains were born, before you birthed the earth and the inhabited world, from forever in the past to forever in the future, you are God. But you return people to dust saying, Go back, humans, because in your perspective, a thousand years are just like yesterday, past, like a short period during a night watch. You sweep humans away like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. You know, in theory, each of us is really insignificant. We're here for such a short time, and there have been so many people over the course of, of creation. According to PBS, about 117 billion people have been born on earth since the beginning of time. 117 billion. Why should we even believe in God if we're so insignificant as single people? Because each one of us, each one of you matters to God. 
Our faith teaches us that God made us in his image and that he knows and he loves us unconditionally. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, we read, Dear friends, let us practice loving each other, for love comes from God, and those who are loving and kind show that they are children of God and that they are getting to know him better. Isn't this true? You can almost see a person who has a beautiful faith in God because they're loving and they're kind. And that's something that we should all aspire to be, to be more like God. The scriptures also teach us that we're never alone. As the psalmist wrote, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear evil for God is with us. Jesus taught us to love God with our entire heart, mind, soul, and strength as we try our best to understand God's will for our lives. God has a purpose for each one of us, and our lives are not meant to be insignificant. Now, back in 1666, we're going to have a little history lesson here again about London, but this time it's not about the Wesleys. So after the Great Fire of 1666, a man named Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a fabulous church, absolutely gorgeous. It took him 45 years to finish, and the dome is 365 feet one of the tallest in the world, even today. And many famous people, including the, the architect, Christopher Wren, had been buried in its famous basement crypts. On one of the church's walls, on a plain marker, you can read these words. Here in its foundations lies the architect of this church and city, Christopher Wren, who lived beyond 90 years not for his own profit, but for the public good. Reader, if you seek his monument or his grave, basically, look around you. His monument is the church he built. God created Christopher Wren to build this beautiful, fantastic church. Now, Christopher Wren lived for just some 90 years and that seems insignificant in the grand scheme of things again, doesn't it? But look at the monument he left behind, this beautiful cathedral. My friends, what is your monument? What is your legacy? What is God's plan? What is God calling you to do? You are made in God's image and God loves you unconditionally. You are significant, and your life matters. Amen. Now I invite you to say the Apostles' Creed together, and I will be leading you in the ecumenical version. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.